Uh, and if you could start by saying who you are and where you're from. Thank you. Oh, you and please you might use the microphone as well. Hilary Kerr. I'm interested in development, have worked in it, but I'm not currently doing so. Um, I want to know if banks are considered companies to be dealt with under everything that's been discussed this afternoon. Um, because I understand that financial regulation, international financial regulation within banks is very tricky. So I wonder how, uh, and that they're trying to uh, avoid it. So I wonder how that's going to be, how, you know, that might compromise what you're attempting to do at the moment. And Thanks. similarly with the um, international accountancy companies, how they're, because there's so few of them and we don't really know who they're accountable to and we will be looking at them to get involved in this process. So. Thank you. Thank you. Ken Caldwell, uh, I'm an advisor to international NGOs and policy issues. I wanted to ask a question mainly of Michael. Michael, you gave us a very good overview of the outcomes of Loch Erne, but I wonder if I could push you a bit more on the politics of it, given that the panel seems to be agreeing this is a start rather than the finish, and to ask you to expand a bit on what are the big uh, political forces across the G8 or G20 countries that might act as barriers or breaks on seeing this agenda through, and any thoughts you have about my, how we might take those forward. Thank you. And one, one over here. Hello, yes. Yeah, so I'm Steve Tibbet. I'm a consultant. I'd like to know um, uh, what, uh, what your expectations from Lock Ernie, and how did the uh, outcomes compare with your, with your expectations? Uh, and uh, how did it compare with uh, previous G8s? Thank you. Actually, why don't we take one more, Sam, over here. Yeah, thank you. I'm Sam Bickersteth. I run the Climate and Development Knowledge Network. Um, Christine, your, your great question about the broader issue about tax um, being part of the norms about how societies work uh, and the fact that we ought to be having taxes without borders, not just tax inspectors without borders, raises the issue about how climate finance fits into this, where we've got a great um, sort of market failure with respect to carbon. Um, and I suppose the question to the panel is, is where they see a route towards, towards addressing the issues which we call climate finance and addressing the issues such as, such as climate change. It's just one example of global public goods failures um, and global public goods and the need to, need to address them and, and where this might connect. Thanks. What, what I'd like to see is maybe, Michael, there are a couple of specifics on the, um, the politics and expectations. Um, then maybe, Richard, if you could take the particular question on banking and accounting companies. And then, Christine, I think yeah. the one on climate finance is directed to you. Yeah. I'll do my best. Um, so, Steve, I'll start with your question about outcomes compared with expectations. I, mean, I think one of the things about this G8, comparing it to previous ones, is G8s in, in the past tend to have two kinds of things. They have sort of feel-good language about we think these things are important. Um, and just pick up climate change, there's long-standing language, it's been in G8 communiques about climate change, that says we think this is important, and we think it's important, and we think it's important, and we think that we're going to think it's important in other fora. Um, Sorry, that's a little bit harsh, but I mean, the, you know, kind of just signaling, giving political signaling about what's important. That's been a lot of G8s. And then G8s in the past have tended to have particular initiatives. So examples are um, the Global Fund for AIDS, TB, Malaria was a G8 initiative. It was kind of launched in G8. The, um, or they have, uh, last year, the New Alliance for Agriculture launched by the US was an initiative. Um, or the G8s in the past have had chunks of money pledged. That's a very common thing. Um, so the Muskoka G8 held by Canada had specific pledging about maternal mortality funding. So this one was quite different because this G8 was mainly about policy commitments and it was about actions to be taken. And there were initiatives in it, so there were a number of, part global, there were a number of partnerships and there's partnerships on land transparency, partnerships on extractives transparency, for example, implicit partnerships on tax uh, cooperation, which we're going to do. And you know, 
the new alliance last year, which was the main part of the G8 last year, apart from Deauville, had some transparent, had some partnerships on agriculture, and that was the whole G8. And this had at least three different sets of partnerships, and it had a bunch of other policy stuff. So how does it compare? This was, you know, I'm, I'm not just saying this because we were involved, but it, it compared to most G8s, it was a very, very much more ambitious agenda. Um, and it tried to cover lots of different things. Um, and, you know, and there are a number of reasons for that. So, but it, it was particularly difficult because it was about trying to get policy change. And I think what we found out is that getting policy change is a lot harder than just writing a check. So that's a little bit about expectation. Um, I, I was very pleased with where we got to on beneficial ownership, on tax, on, you know, these, we had ambitions that were higher, to be absolutely honest about it. We really wanted to get further on some of these things, but as far as we got, it was, it was a good outcome. And that connects then, Ken, to your question about politics. Um, the politics in the G8, the politics in all G8s always, and this is a dirty secret which I will share with you um, publicly, is the way the G8 works is the presidency of the G8, whoever is in the lead, wants to get lots done, and they want to claim that lots was done under the presidency. Um, and all the other G8 members spend their time dragging their heels, saying, oh, oh, it's difficult. I don't know if we're going to be able to do that. And so there's a kind of politics around this, which is there's one member of the G8. And we know that next year, it's Russia's turn to push us. And we'll look at our toes and say, oh, this is all very difficult, and so on. Because that's just the way the G8 runs. This year, we had a series of specific pol politics, political issues, because we were asking some big things. Um, Looks like you need to go on. I, I no, can no, give no, you a, a, longer, a longer account of the specifics of, I mean, basically, we, we had, you know, because there were so many issues on the table, we had differences with all the G8 countries on something, somewhere through. And there was a lot of negotiating late into the night, especially on beneficial ownership. And it, in the end, the thing that really made a difference, I guess as always, it was Prime Minister Cameron bit of putting his personal effort into it and saying to his peers, look, this really matters to me. I want you to deliver, or our relationship's going to suffer. Um, I, to be crude about it. Thank you. Richard. Banks are companies. Yes. Um, you know, that's the long and short of it. Um, they're incorporated entities. They are subject to taxation. Um, they sometimes have their own special taxation rules, um, in which they, by and large, share with insurance companies. But they are going to be subject to this as much as anybody else is. They're also going to be lobbying like fury against everything that's probably being proposed because you, know, you will not find a tax haven where there isn't um, a major bank um, whose name you know and you might even bank with. Um, even more so if we look at the big four firms of accountants. Um, I was once asked on the BBC what were the four biggest threats to democracy, and I named them as Ernst & Young, KPMG, <laughs> Deloitte, <laughs> and PricewaterhouseCoopers. And they say, we're well, a little surprised that I hadn't named North Korea. And I said, no, no, no. These are the four organisations that exist in every tax haven around the world with the single concerted effort of undermining the tax revenues of the elected governments of the world. Therefore, they're the biggest threat to democracy that exists. And they will undoubtedly also, therefore, be lobbying really quite hard against the idea of country-by-country country reporting. I assure you, they are. They hate it. They loathe it. Why has this had to go through OECD? Why has this had to go through the EU? Because they have fundamentally blocked it in the International Accounting Standards Board, which has the capacity to deliver it because they own 20% of the International Accounting Standards Board, which is itself a privately owned company registered in Delaware, USA, which is a tax haven. <laughs> so, you know, there we see the problem we're facing and why we've had to have the political workaround. These banks, I mean, my friend and colleague, Prem Sikker at Essex University, calls banks, lawyers, and accountants collectively the pinstripe mafia. Um, they are because they populate the world's tax havens. And we're going to have to deal with that problem. The fact is, though, that if we use intelligent thinking, we can work around it. The G8 has proved that already that we can begin work rounds. The EU is proving it can get this information by putting down legislation in the accounting directive against the intense lobbying of the big four accountants and the biggest companies. And some companies are saying, do you know, actually, this might be to our competitive advantage to comply. 
And this is the point I'm making about the fact that actually we need to begin to embrace those companies who will mm. talk to us about this and who do understand that in an efficient market, information is key to investment allocation decisions and you get a better outcome for the world as a result. That, for those of you who have studied economics, is first term undergraduate economics. Information is key to investment decision making. So what we can say to these people when they object is you're actually preserving monopoly rights, you're preserving the wealth of an elite, and you're trying to undermine fair competition. We are, in the tax justice campaign, the biggest pro-business lobby that exists because we want the information that business operates efficiently. And they really get upset when I say that. But it's true. And so we've got to actually take the arguments head on, but with confidence knowing what we're talking about. And when I said we need to do research and so on, that's what I mean. We can win these arguments. We are winning these arguments. There's further to go. But let's not feel intimidated, because for all that enormous budget, um, I always wonder how much um, Jersey spends to oppose my few blogs. I write about them every week. But it's a fortune in PR, and yet I seem to be winning the PR argument for almost nothing. And you know, we can win against those budgets with the right arguments. And I think when we talk about the morality of taxation and so on, we're winning. Thank you. Christian. Thanks. And, and I think there's a, there's a lot in there that you translate into the climate argument as well. I think t two quick things. One was there was a huge amount of NGO pressure um, through um, organisations coming together in the IF campaign in particular to, to actually give David Cameron and even George Osborne the kind of um, increase in that personal commitment. That's what we like to think anyway. But th certainly the, the sort of pressure that, that we were putting on um, mixed with the kind of you know Google and Starbucks kind of um, phenomena as well. But I, I do think that kind of public pressure was really important in sort of creating that because even the fact that um, I don't know quite when the decision was taken about tax and tax havens and all that kind of stuff being on the agenda, but we knew that it was, you know, that's not, that wasn't kind of what it was like at the beginning. So in terms of the climate change issue, I think there were, that we're clearly in a very disappointing situation in regards to climate finance, and there's a lot more, there's a lot more work to be done. Um, and I think there's something about the narrative, there's something about the way in which the, the agenda has shifted around tax, that, you know, as I said before, people... People might use language like beneficial ownership and, and transfer pricing, but deep down they know what they're talking about is fairness. Deep down they know that there's something really quite fundamentally not quite right. And I think what we've got, our challenge in, in climate change is to actually find the same kind of meta-narrative. That, you know, this is, this is not just some big, massive, overwhelming issue that we can't do anything about. There's a real similarity there with the global tax system. There are things that we can do but also we've got to recognise what it is that we need to do and how we kind of reach that kind of big, big picture question, which I think is a similar sort of question about fairness. Not about fairness now, but about fairness for future generations. And for me, th one of those challenges is around finding that message. I think there's also a balance between what we might call as a political stream or an insider stream and the public stream. Um, and what we've seen as NGOs working over the last year in relation to this is the balance between the two. They're not mutually exclusive. You can be both an insider working politically and you can be an outsider doing your public mobilisation. Mm -hmm. They're not mutually exclusive and in an ideal world they actually mutually reinforce one another. Mm -hmm. But you know, political messages and public messages are not always the same. But we're all grown-ups. We all know the rules of the game here. We all know that that's how it can work. So there's a real sophistication, there's a real kind of challenge to each of us about how we identify that, that narrative and where we find those kind of underlying questions um, to be able to reinforce the language. And find the opportunities. To some extent this year, the, we have had a kind of al an alignment of the stars, you know, both in terms of you know, the, the Prime Minister's own commitment, the G8 opportunity, the, the Google and Starbucks phenomena, the, the pressure that organisations and NGOs have been putting on. So it's all, all those sorts of things have come together. And I think, you know, to, sometimes we can engineer those things as well. So I think there's a lot of hope in tactics if we can learn for climate change, and we're going to do that. Mm. Thanks, Christine. Um, Lee, there's, there's one question that we've had from uh, one, of the one of the viewers of the event which is from Joe Williams, who published What You Pay in the UK, which basically makes the point that under the Dodd-Frank legislation on extractive industries in, in the US, 
the information that's made available is publicly disclosed. And the, 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 the question is basically why then will the OECD BEPS approach only suggest disclosure to tax authorities? Surely there are other stakeholders like citizens and investors. Well, I think the simple answer to that is um, that that's what the countries and governments so far have said they're prepared to do. Um, I think I heard Richard say, um, you know, it's one step maybe along the process. Um, the view of governments is that um, the administration of tax should be done by the tax administrations, and it it is for the. It's also true that the information you will get um, from the type of information you're getting by country by country reporting will be indicative for risk assessment purposes. It will not tell you, for example, whether the pricing is right or wrong. What it will do is tell you that a group's profits mainly arise in a certain country where it may or may not be taxed heavily. And that will give you as a country some risk assessment information. Um, prior to working for the OECD, I worked on some common in the South African Revenue Service, and, and what developing countries really struggle with is getting information about the counterparty in the foreign country. And this is a big step to enable them to get information about the counterparts yeah. in the other countries. So it's a very, very big step forward for the tax administrations. Mm -hmm. and at the moment, so, so I think it is a step, and where it goes from there is not for me to comment on, but um, that's why we're doing this within the transfer pricing documentation rules, um, because we see it as key to assessing transfer pricing risk. A and what we want to do is come up with something that is a common template, because that will reduce compliance costs mm. for business, and at the same time, it'll make sure all tax administrations get the same information, who obviously are, have a company that or a permanent establishment or whatever of a multinational enterprise. Thank you. Um, let's do another round of questions. Could you one very quick brief one? comment on that, if I could. One of the objections that has always been made to country by country reporting by large companies is A, it's not possible, and B, it will cost too much. Well, actually, the OECD is now going to say you're going to do it whether it's possible or not, so therefore it is possible. We know that. <laughs> and secondly, if you're doing it for tax, the cost of putting it up into your, on your website or attaching it to your accounts is about a fiver. So that, those arguments to the publication of country-by-country country reporting information in the future in the public domain have disappeared. Therefore, I welcome this because we've beaten the two main arguments to publication. Thanks. Let's do another another round. Quite a lot of hands going up right now. So, over here. Hi, I'm David Hall Matthews from Publish What You Fund. Um, Michael, you said that the Open Data Charter was the least talked about but potentially most transformative aspect of the declaration. So I think we've demonstrated the first point is correct because nobody else has mentioned it since. <laughs> um, but um, I mean, it it is almost too good to be true. It's you know all data. Uh, published by default, not just some bits, not just the bits that are FOIA requested. Um, so I'm sort of a little bit of a version of the question you got earlier. What was the politics on this? Have we really got eight buy-ins? I mean, you mentioned mm. aid transparency as an aspect of that, and four of the G8 countries still don't think they've signed IAT, even after the declaration said they have. So um, how confident are you that this extremely radical agenda will be bought into by how many of the G8 countries? Thanks. And one question right here. Hi there. My name's Amanda Jackson. I'm from MICA Challenge. And um, I just wanted to ask Michael, Kevin and Lee, who all mentioned the importance of the G20 in taking the process onward, what sort of time frame do they see as being practical in getting the G20 to um, make decisions that are binding, that are practical, that are technical, that are doable? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Did you have a question? Please, yeah. In the interest of efficiency, it's a short journey. Um, I'm Yara Foriansa from the Mo Ibrahim Foundation. Um, most of the responses that I've seen to the, um, the outcomes of the G8 summit criticise the fact that um, the beneficial ownership registries won't be available to the public. I just wondered if you could touch on that. OK, and one right back here. Uh, 
Paddy Coulter from the Oxford uh, Poverty and Human Development Initiative, OFI. Um, it really follows the uh, Public Sector Fund question. I just want to push Michael a little bit more on what he thinks is the timetable for it. Because if IATI is to give us a clue, what well, that was launched at the high, high Level Forum in Accra, when was that? 2008. And five years later, G8, for the first time, has done what it, what you say it's done. Um, what, what's the timetable? And what's the engine that will propel this forward? Because uh, it's not just political, but technical problems. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm, I'm, f I'm fascinated by what you say, but I, none of the others have really sketched in what the machinery might be. On data. On data. Okay, Let, let's take um, that batch of questions. If, if you could keep the answers relatively short, we can yes, probably squeeze yes, out right. another yeah. batch in. Yeah, yes, but right. I guess the, the big question, Michael, is it, is it too good to be true? I mean, look, I, <coughs> I mean, it's just a chance that G8 countries didn't quite recognize what they signed up to in the Open Data Church. <laughs> Not with people like you at the helm, surely. Well, um, but, you know, the basic principles about enhanced transparency were certainly discussed by them, and they could have all bought into them. And I do think Prime Minister Cameron made a very compelling case about the future is transparent, and that this is about creating modern economies that are good for citizens and good for business and good for companies, um, and that, that that was part of the pitch. Um, implementing the Open Data Charter, it has some variable geometry because it, the Open Data Charter, each country, each G8 country has to commit to which data sets are going to be made machine readable um, and inter with interoperability. Um, and different countries are going to go at different speeds, I think, for that. Um, so there, there is, look, there, there's definitely been some contingency to it. I used to, in a previous life, I used to be an international lawyer. And I witnessed the kellogg Brion Pact of 1928, which prohibited the use of force in international affairs forever, which was lots of countries signed up to and was a glorious success. Um, so recognize that just signing up is not necessarily compliance. There's a lot to be done. Organizations like Publish What You Pay and so on have a lot to do in you know, keeping our feet to the fire. For the G8, there will be an accountability process. So this is one of the places where it's very clear what success looks like and we can measure whether countries are living up to it or not. And I think that's going to be very helpful going forward. Um, the Patty, responding to Patty's point, I, on the IATI specific point, I think that um, you know, that's now agreed within the Busan um, framework of combining the CRS initiative plus the IATI initiative is a, is a common standard. And it has to be implemented by 2015, and I, th I genuinely think it's going to happen. Um, the broader data stuff, a lot of it's going to be about technical matters, and you know it's going to take time to implement. Um, the question about G20, what's it going to do? Um, so the G20, there's a critical G20 Sherpa meeting that's going on tomorrow and the next day, and that's going to make a lot of decisions about what will be decided at the St. Petersburg summit in early September. So I think by the 10th of September, well, by the 7th of September, we'll know a lot about where the G20 is on this. I think it's looking pretty positive, not least because of the finance ministers making their announcement last week. The G20 finance minister's endorsement of the BEPS was a huge thing. And the last point, do you want me to answer about the public registries or? Why not? Okay. And then sure. Yeah. So public registries, look, I mean, Prime Minister Cameron has been really clear. He thinks public registries would be a good thing. Thinks are well, no, he's, he thinks they're very strong arguments in favor of public registries, is what he said. He also wants to have a genuine public consultation. Um, so now, between now and 16th of September, do put your views in, please, on what you think the UK regime should look like. Um, yes, NGOs were disappointed. You know, I think politically the reality was getting agreement on central registries was the first step. Public registries will be the next step. Were we disappointed we didn't get more clear commitments to public registries in the G8 context? Well, you know, that was certainly one of the ambitions. Um, but I think that political reality was that these things don't all happen at once and that was, we're going to make progress. I, I, there are specific things I could say about the paragraph um, involved. That one of the things is the information has to be available to other authorities, which potentially includes legal authorities such as courts. So there may be a broader component there in the communique for transparency.
It was interesting that during the course of the meeting we had earlier this afternoon when we were discussing this, I got an email from Private Eye which said, we've endorsed your bill. Read it this week and you'll discover why you won't get it. <laughs> All I can say is they're giving me a little enigmatic um, lead into a story about a UK politician who won't want a public registry, apparently. Um, anyway, we'll see. Look, the reason why we need a public registry is very straightforward. I want to give you some simple facts about the UK register of companies. There are three million companies on it. That is more per head of population in the UK than any other country in Europe. Of those three million com uh, companies, about 400,000 will disappear without trace in the next year. I mean, literally without trace. Nobody will know anything about them. We will never know who owned them. We will never know any accounts about them, and they will never declare any tax liability. Some of them will definitely be undertaking massive taxation fraud. As Global Witness proved last year, one of the companies that disappeared actually turned over a billion dollars but never filed a set of accounts in the UK and never owned up to its existence. So we need that. But we need it for a very simple, straightforward reason, that these companies, these fraudulent companies, are actually undermining the UK marketplace by introducing fraud as a normal part of commercial life in the UK. Of those three million companies, only about two million will be asked to submit a tax return. And of those that are asked to submit a tax return, maybe 1.3 million will. That is, less than half the companies in the UK will actually submit a tax return, and of those, only about 60% will pay tax. We're now down to less than a million of the three million companies will ever pay any tax, and that's basically because we haven't got the resources in our company's house and in HM Revenue and Customs to discover who these companies are, and I estimate that costs us £16 billion a year. How much has the NHS got to save? £20 billion. What would you rather? We went after the fraudsters or cut the NHS? That's the sort of question that is going to have to be raised by you, of politicians, as to why you need a public registry, because we need the information where these people are held to account. And the simple answer here is to actually get banks to disclose the information about who's got a bank account. Because a company without a bank account is probably not a problem to us, because it probably isn't trading. But a company with a bank account is a problem to us, because then, if they're not sending in accounts, they're making money illegally. And as simply and straightforwardly, if we actually required the money laundering information that they hold to HM Revenue and Customs, and we banned a company being struck off if it had a bank account which hadn't been shut, then at that moment, this would become an effective register which would collect tax. And that would transform not just the basis of trade in the UK, because everybody would be accountable and this opportunity for abuse would disappear, it would also change the cuts agenda and therefore the way in which we'd be addressing politics in this country as well. This is a massive issue of concern. We should be adopting it as an issue, not just for developing countries, but here. And that's why I say this is a particular national interest as well as an international interest, and we have to understand it in both contexts, because the same is also true in many countries throughout the world. Thank you, Jim. Um, now, if we could keep this last round of questions relatively brief, we could take four. So, uh, and we've got at least six uh, <laughs> over here. we we'll start on that side. Hi, thank you. My name is Orla Ryan. I work in mobile telecoms, particular interest in mobile commerce, banking the unbanked. Um, a quick question for uh, Michael, if I may. Um, to point eight, I'm particularly interested in the trade question. Governments should roll back protectionism and agree new trade deals. Were there any sort of top three high-level hows that they might achieve quite a broad Thanks. aim? Um, right back here. Uh, John Morgan, I'm a development consultant. Um, I also wanted to try and bring in the trade agenda, um, hopefully uh, um <coughs> with a uh, slightly tricky thing of, of bringing it from the tax side as well, which is around um, rent-seeking elites and how we address them and how realistic it is to think that uh, current development programming can actually uh, create the incentive for change in the countries that, that need to change. Um, and that also uh, feeds through to the trade facilitation agenda where we have um, strong incentives in many developing countries for trade not to cross okay. borders quickly. Thank you. Front row. Ed Davey, um, Prince's Trust, and no jokes about tr tax, please, with respect to the Prince. Um, but a question about how effective the IF campaign was from the point of view of the PM. Okay. Michael. 
Ian Sanson from the Development Initiative. Um, just a question following up Michael's point. Um, ha, uh, should the G8 and the G20 development accountability process be brought closer together? And are we looking for big successes from the G20 process in September? Okay. Last question, Jim. Yeah. Um, um, I think um, this is the easy bit. This is the easy bit we're dealing with, actually, because um, it all sounds so cozy, right, um, sitting here. But when it comes to the assessment, the tax assessment of itself, right, there's a lot of variations between one country and another. Secondly, also, when it comes to the thinking, the, think, the thinking mind of the accountant, it's absolutely different from, I mean, the public interest and all this other pers 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 perspective of, um, I mean, looking at the morality of taxation and these sort of things. Do you think when it actually comes to the, to the how, which is the implementation side of this whole, of this whole cozy, Right, um, ideas of policy framework you guys are sitting, I mean, talking about here. Do you think it will be successful? I mean, the energy, will, will the energy be here now? And then within a few years, the energy die out? Is, is the sooner the, I mean, uh, uh, um, the, the, the G8 begin to uh, um, recover the economy? Thank you. Um, so, uh, with an appeal to all of you to keep your energy levels high for this last batch of questions. Um, let's start from this end of the table. Maybe there are a couple of specifics that you might want to touch on, but if you could also use it as a sort of wrap-up point. And then, Michael, I'll come to you right, right at the end if that's okay. Good. I, I think your question about implementation it is a good question um, for, for how a country is going to go around assessing tax and will new rules have an impact. Um, We'll have to wait and see in terms of what changes there are. The BEPS plan um, suggests two, it's got two expected outputs within it, really. Some are recommendations, which will be around how countries design their domestic tax rules, and some are changes that are within the capacity, basically, of the OECD to change. So, for example, changing the transfer pricing guidelines, changing the model tax convention. So it will be a mix of those two. Uh, and the plan sets out um, a timetable for those things, which basically takes us um, into 2014 and into 2015. And then I think the key issue then will be developing the capacity in developing countries to put those changes into effect. Uh, and I think TIWB, Trans Inspectors Without Borders, will be key to whether that's successful or not. And key to that will be whether developed countries are able to supply tax auditors to help developing countries. And I guess my plea to end on would be to develop countries to provide that supply. We have no question about having the demand. Thanks, George. Christine, could I ask you maybe just to reflect a bit on the question that uh, Davey raised about the effectiveness of the IF campaign? Um, well, I think he really wanted to know whether or not the Prime Minister thought it was effective, so I'll leave that one to, to, to Michael. But I think um, from, from our perspective as NGOs, um, we, we feel that there was a tremendous, s tremendously strong political traction. There was a really strong political impact for us in terms of what we saw out of and also the kind of responses back that we were getting from uh, Number 10 and the Treasury. Um, even just in terms of setting the agenda, let alone what came out of the agenda in the first place. And I think that's a really important lesson, um, that 200 organisations came together, um, you know, buried the hatchet of their differences and were able to kind of work together as mm. much as possible. The, it wasn't a perfect campaign by, by far, but, you know, it was really uh, impactful. And I think um, in terms of the public mobilisation side, you know, we probably didn't get as many bodies in the park as, as we wanted, but we certainly got a very significant change in terms of the kind of um, on, online, online traffic. Um, there was something like 50 million kind of um, uh, virtual interventions and engagements with the campaign, and that wasn't just one person tweeting himself all the time. <laughs> but I think the other thing that I want to say finally in, t in terms of this debate is about taking it forward, and your point about implementation, which is really critical... That's why, from Christian Aid's perspective, developing countries being properly and meaningfully integrated in this process is so key, for two reasons. One is that, you know, t the, the kind of the tax dodgers don't just exist, um, you know, in, in the north, and they don't just exist in the south. The, the, there are tax dodgers sort of all around the world that are using the, um, the fact that we have a broken system 
our, system, our international tax system does not work. And so if a system doesn't work, then you're always going to be in a culture of compliance. You know, if you're, if you're an accountant or whatever, I don't know, I don't want to be rude to accountants, but you're always then going to be looking for ways out. And part of our challenge is, let's have a system that works so there ain't any escape, you know, so that we can actually make it work for people in poverty. And, that, and then the other side of this is, this is about freeing up revenue, which is massive. Some of the figures we've talked about are massive. We need to also make sure that our ongoing development programme in DFID takes seriously governance, participation, accountability in countries to help build civil society, to continue to build civil society, so that their own governments are using that money in the way in which they want it to be used and not just to go and plate another set of taps. We don't want this to be a rich person stitch up wherever those rich persons are from. This is not about responding to the elites. This is about finding a much more just world. Thanks, Christy. All. Richard. You use the phrase, the thinking mind of an accountant. I think there's a lot of assumptions in there. <laughs> I speak as a chartered accountant. Um, I won't go any further. No. I go back to this basic appeal. We've got to now move on from the purely political argument of is there a tax justice issue? Yes, there is. Now we have to design how that really delivers. And some things have existed. I mean, we've always been a solution-focused campaign. So country-by-country country reporting was there. We've been developing ideas on automatic information exchange for years at a time when very few people were willing to talk about those things and saying this is how we can do it, at least in outline. Um, we've been talking about the problem of tax havens, rent-seeking elites and how they use them, and it's highlighting these issues. So in the sense we've been a solution-focused <laughs> campaign, We've been successful, and I think that is where it's all fed into the IF campaign, and I think the IF campaign in that sense coalesced. There were problems with the IF campaign. It didn't bring the trade unions in, for example, uh, which actually previous um, stamp out poverty didn't solve. Um, but overall, you know, uh, this G8 would not have happened without the NGO community having created that momentum for change, nor would even the newspaper articles have happened, by the way. Mm. Because the Google story only launched on the third attempt. We tried it in 2008, 2009, and it mm. flopped. In 2011, it took off because the environment was right. And I was involved in all three, so I know, you know the first two, they really failed. So in that sense, it worked. Will we tackle rent-seeking elites? Yes, with automatic information exchange, if we can get beneficial ownership information. Yes, because this also, and the BEPS plan also, endorses the idea of not giving tax relief on payments to those locations where the rent-seeking elites have tried to accumulate their wealth. Offshore is where most of the rent-seeking elite try to accumulate their wealth. So there are very powerful ideas which have not previously really been very popular with the OECD, if I think it's fair to say. No, I won't go any further than that, Lee, and that's not you personally, but I think they have not been popular. And now there's this creeping idea that we have to actually tackle this problem in unconventional and yet glaringly obvious ways, which challenge the theories of free movement of capital. Because sometimes free movements of capital actually undermine the effectiveness of trade and taxation. So. That's why I say we're making progress. But we need to think about some things which are new challenges. And the phone trade is one of those, by the way. So I jumped on your comment. Yes. Because actually earlier, oh no, a year ago, I tried to do, launch a project with a bunch of academics on how do we tax the trade through phones? Because there's a natural data capture system there. In many environments where there is no normal information capture system. Is that a way in which we can actually look at taxing small businesses in some countries where there's no information? We've got to think broadly and carefully about how we move forward and how we work in a new environment. Lots of work to do, and yet the opportunity is there now, and I don't think it was before the G8, and that's why I'm still pleased with the outcome, and yet mm. disappointed. <laughs> 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 and I, and I, should, I hope whoever is taking minutes got that down in full. <laughs> <laughs> Michael. Thank you. I'll try to be brief. If you could touch on the trade questions as well, Michael, yes, in passing at least. The, you asked about the top three things to do on trade. I think the, a really important thing is um, making trade work within Africa is a really important thing in terms of infrastructure and border crossings and so on. You know, it's not about regulation alone. It's all about what works. And, all, and there's a tax question, which is regimes which are highly dependent upon tariffs as a revenue base are never going to reduce their tariffs. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. shifting the revenue base is really important. But the other two things are um, the Bali Agreement on Trade Facilitation is potentially really important for the world, for developing countries. And I think the EU-US trade deal is um, a, 
offers lots of opportunities, but the challenge is making sure that it benefits developing countries as well. And I think that you know a big deal really has a potential for doing that, and we're committed to following that closely and make sure it does. I think the rent seeking, John, I think Richard's hit answered that. Uh, Ed, your question about the IF campaign. The pro I've not asked the Prime Minister how he's evaluated the IF campaign. Um, but I know that at Lochern, in his press conference, he was full of praise for the campaigning work of NGOs. And I know that he takes it very seriously, and I know that he's influenced by it. And I think that I count myself very lucky to be in a country where there is such high quality policy work done by NGOs and combined with such good communication efforts. I think it makes the UK a much better place to live. And to be absolutely honest, I wish that other G8 countries had it as richly as we do um, because it's, 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 it makes it much easier to be in government if that's going on. Um, and Ian, your question about the G20, G, you asked a series of questions. The one I'm going to focus on is should the accountability processes be brought together? I don't think so, and it's just because of the sensitivity of the non-G8 members of the G20. I think that the politics are not, maybe five years from now, but not now. Um, so I'll stop at that. Michael, thank you, and thank you to everybody. I, I, th I think we've had an amazingly rich discussion, actually, and then you, it's spurred by your presentation, so, so thank you to all of you for that. I mean, th there's a couple of things I take out of this. One is that this is clearly not an issue that's going to go away. And it's really important that I think all of us monitor the outcomes of this, you know, this real watershed event very, very closely. Um, secondly, and, uh, and just thinking this through from a development research perspective, I, I'm, I'm really struck by you know, how probably in this institution we need to skill up actually to really track this agenda effectively and to engage with it. Because I, I do think in a sense it's something that the development community has nibbled away at mm. over the years but hasn't really got hold of. And, and, you know, now is the, is the time to, to do that. So um, please join with me in thanking our speakers for <laughs> the presentation. And um, see you after the next G8 to reflect <laughs> on the... You'll be doing something totally different by then, of course. Yeah, then maybe before that. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. You're not going to have a post G20. And you feed back into well, yeah. you'll see you'll probably see some public some documents come out for public consultation. So so for example, the draft yeah. white paper on transfer pricing yeah. documentation. Yeah. As I say, they're they're, they're for, for public consultation, not just for business yeah. consultation. So feed you can feed back through those papers and you'll see the name of the person to feed back to on the bottom of each paper as it comes out. What will happen is as things are developed, so papers will come out on them from the different working parties. Yes. Because it won't get much as a, as a private member's day, but it might well go back then to the day. And then you actually get quite a good.